Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A new year is upon us. Happy New Year. 2020. There's been much ado in the past few weeks on the internet, people using the label 2020 for branding or marketing purposes for a new vision or a better vision or a clearer vision for a path into the future to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. I too will admit that I often think of a new year as a fresh start, a new beginning, a second chance, a do-over, if you will. And I'm not shy to say that we Christians should have, or could have, or definitely have, a jump start on that concept. After all, we worship a God of forgiveness, right? We worship a God who is all about forgiveness, which translates into fresh starts, new beginnings, second chances. And then there's resurrection, the very heart of our faith. And if resurrection doesn't say new beginning, then I don't know what does. We always have an opportunity to see a new way, to see a new way that God is at work doing a new thing for the purpose of reaching more and more people. And that includes reaching out to us, reaching out to you, reaching out to me, but also reaching out to so many more, often people that we would think are beyond reach. Now, one way that God speaks to us and reveals to us what God is up to is through scriptures. And yes, I know that this is an old, old story. I also know that the more we hear it, the more we read it, the more we study it, God is creatively working to reveal a new way of seeing it, of hearing it, a new way of receiving it, a new way, yes, of even living it. Today's story, the visit of the Magi, is one such story. Yes, an old, old story. But I invite you to enter it with me. And together let us see what new things God desires to reveal to us today. Right out of the gate in this old, old story, God seems to be expanding our vision. God seems to be expanding our vision as Matthew tells of some wise men from the east who have followed a star. They are reading the signs of the heavens. It is a cosmic event that's happening and correlates to quite a grand event on earth, and that is the birth of Jesus, the new king. And this star is leading them to the place where the new king has been born. There's speculation about who these wise men might be. Perhaps they come from Persia. Perhaps they are Zoroastrian priests who indeed study the stars and are astrologers. And so as you can discern from that, they are foreigners from another country and they practice a different religion. In Matthew's gospel, the wise men represent the nations of the world. It's the fulfillment of the scriptures. The prophet Isaiah had said, by you all nations will be blessed. All nations will come to know the Messiah. The wise men have seen the light which has led them, and they come to pay homage, to worship, and to bring gifts to the king. So back in Luke's gospel, it was the lowly shepherds who received the message and go to see the newborn Jesus and in turn worship God. So from the lowliest of the low in Luke's gospel, we go to Matthew's gospel, and there we have the far out foreigners representing other nations. God is ever expanding the vision for those to whom Christ comes. Now there's been a joke floating around for some time that if it had been wise women, they would have asked for directions, they would have arrived on time, they would have helped deliver the baby, 
They would have brought practical gifts, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and there would be peace on earth. <laughs> but according to the story, in Matthew's Gospel, the wise men did indeed ask for directions. They stopped by the palace in Jerusalem and they asked Herod for some direction. And, of course, according to the Isaiah prophecy, Jerusalem was the place to which all nations would come. Up on God's high mountain, holy mountain, all the nations would come. So quite possibly the wise men from the east had heard of the Isaiah prophecy. But in fact, it was the lesser known prophet Micah that had written that little old Bethlehem would not be forgotten. For from Bethlehem would come a ruler who is to shepherd God's people. So Herod then summons the chief priests and scribes to scour the scripture to find this information. But Matthew reminds us that Herod is not to be trusted. And Matthew assumes that everyone knows the treachery and conniving that are behind Herod's attaining the power that he has and the lengths to which he will go or has gone to keep it, like executing some of his own family members, including his wife. Matthew tells us that Herod was afraid when the wise men showed up, hearing this news of a newborn king Matthew also tells us that all of Jerusalem with him was afraid. And indeed, they were afraid because they know Herod, and they know he will not take this news lightly and will in some way act upon it. So then we have these Jewish chief priests and scribes who then pour over the scriptures and find in the prophet Micah the prophecy that Bethlehem is the place from where a new king will come. They make their report to Herod. Herod gives directions to the wise men. And then Herod asks for a report so that he too might go and pay homage to the newborn king. But later we learn this is but a trick. That Herod does not intend to pay homage but rather intends to eliminate the opposition. So what about these chief priests and scribes? Is it just me or do they seem completely detached and uninterested in the arrival of the promised Messiah? I mean, after all, this is their scripture. This is their prophecy from their prophets of old. This is their long-awaited promised Messiah. Why don't they hightail it to Bethlehem? They seem completely apathetic and indifferent. Unless, unless that clue there in Matthew's gospel is that they are paralyzed by their own fear. Because after all, any display of interest or acknowledgement of a newborn king, much less joy or excitement or worship, could possibly mean punishment or even death from Herod's outrage. So then those wise men proceed. They go another nine miles to Bethlehem to visit the new king. And upon arriving at the house, they worship. Matthew notes that upon arriving, they knelt and paid homage. It was the posture of worship. The first thing they did was worship. And Matthew uses that word three times in these 12 verses. The first response is worship. They give their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In last week's reading from Martin Luther's Christmas sermon, it was noted that these gifts were indeed very practical because having been warned in a dream to flee to Egypt that very night, they could use those gifts of gold frankincense, myrrh, these valuable gifts to support themselves as refugees in a foreign land, or even to also help other refugees and other poor people. The Magi, too, were warned to bypass Herod and return home by another way. And I'm sure that having knelt at the feet of Jesus, they were never the same. So there you have it, 12 
verses of adventure, seeking, finding, even treachery, worship, and adoration. What are we to make of this old, old story? In these few verses, there are three very distinct responses to the coming of Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. There is Herod and his response of violent hatred and the desire to be rid of Jesus. There are the chief priests and the scribes and their response of indifference and passivity, lacking a commitment, it seems, or being completely paralyzed by their fear. And then there are the wise men and their response to travel a great distance, to go on an adventurous journey to seek out and find and worship the new king and to bestow him with gifts of honor and adoration. I, for one, think that this old, old story just begs the question, what is your response to the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world? What is our response to this Jesus? Are we like Herod, who like the power and control that we have in our lives and would prefer not to give that up? the way God might have us do in order to follow Jesus as faithful servants? Would we rather be Lord of our own lives? Or are we like the chief priests and scribes who know the stories of the Bible, perhaps many of them by heart, but we have not taken their message and meaning to heart so that our lives are transformed into action and living out the message of God's story? Or like them, do we live in fear and are paralyzed by that fear and we're hesitant to share our faith or we're hesitant to live dependently on God, trusting God's promises to provide what we need? Or are we like the wise men who earnestly seek the Messiah and follow wherever his star may lead in order that we might find him and worship him with overwhelming joy? To be perfectly honest, I see myself in all three. I am Herod when I am judgmental, when I prefer to do what I want, even when I know it should be something else. I know that probably shocks a lot of you. <laughs> but sometimes I like to be in control. I know, it's surprising. But I'm like Herod when I don't want to give up that control, would prefer to take matters in my own hands instead of letting God lead and guide me in the paths that God has provided for me. Sometimes I'm like the chief priests and the scribes when I know all the right answers but fail to act on them, or I'm too afraid to act on what the Lord may be asking. And I have to admit, I'm particularly sensitive to this critique of the chief priests and the scribes because they're the religious establishment of their day. Well, I got news for you, church. You're the religious establishment of today. We are the religious establishment. We're represented by this group. We are the ones who, who have the scriptures, who read the scriptures, who know the old, old story. And we have the traditions of our faith. We have our liturgy that proclaims God's word, our hymns, our prayers, our sacraments, the gathered, worshiping, beloved community. These are near and dear to my heart, and I hope are near and dear to your heart. It's where we expect Christ to come and meet us, and he does. But maybe sometimes we're like the scribes and chief priests. And we sometimes miss the possibility that God could show up someplace far away that will lead people a different way than we have gone. But will lead them still to kneel at the feet of Jesus. We might miss the possibility that God could show up in a star far away and bring foreigners who practiced a different religion to come and worship the Savior, Jesus Christ. 
This gospel makes me wonder what new thing might we be missing that God is trying to tell us and show us by expanding our vision. So yeah, sometimes I'm like Herod, sometimes I'm like the chief priests, insisting on my own way and doing my own thing when I want, when I want it, using all my power and authority to build myself up, me, myself, and I, and of course, accumulating everything I can that is mine, mine, mine. And sometimes I'm the chief priests, apathetic and indifferent on the one hand, or just plain afraid and paralyzed by fear on the other. And in the end, falling short and missing the grace and mercy that God desires to give. But then I want to believe, and I got to believe, that sometimes I'm also like the wise men. And I know you are too. That I can be amazed by a shining star that shows me the wondrous new thing that God is doing, and then venture forth to the place that God is leading me. And then in utter amazement and overwhelming joy, worship at the feet of our Savior. The wise men went a great distance to find Jesus in order to worship him. How far will we go? To what lengths will we go to worship at the feet of our Savior? With a new year of 2020 vision, with the expanded vision of the old, old story, let us be a church that rises up and shines like the light that no darkness can overcome in a renewed commitment to ministry and outreach of this congregation, to make Christ's name known, to be disciples, and to make disciples. Let us be a church that bursts forth in joy in our work and in our serving, in our mission and in our ministry and in our leadership. Let us be a church who, who like the wise men, will go the distance to find Jesus, to worship with overwhelming joy. And then let us, like the wise men, having encountered this Jesus in our worship and praise, let us never be the same because of what we have seen. Because indeed, we have seen what God has done through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.